Welcome, everyone. Good to see some familiar faces and some new faces. We'll, we'll just. Uh, We're not videoed anymore. We'll just give it a few more minutes. See if anybody else comes on. I'm going to share my screen a while. Hope everybody's having a good day, enjoying the, the, the nice weather out there. What? It might help if people put themselves on mute. It uh, looks like the police chief is here. Oh, wonderful. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Hello, everyone. Welcome, chief. Great to have you. Thank you. Great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you, Reverend Bailey. Appreciate it. You're, you're a good man. Thank you. Takes one to know one. <laughs> Hannah, how are we doing? Oh, we're good. Everyone's in so far. Probably have a couple of people show up late, but if you want to get rolling, you probably can. All right. That sounds great. Well, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Dwight Yoder. Uh, many of you uh, have been to prior seminars. And if you're new, welcome. If, if this is a repeat visit, thank you for coming back. Uh, we're all on this journey together to learn about our history. And I'm excited that we could talk about uh, some history related to policing and how it relates to some of the topics we've been talking about. Um, so uh, just a couple of things. Uh, hopefully everybody can see my screen. We'll start with some introductions. Um, I think you all know Reverend Bailey, but Reverend Bailey, why don't you just give a quick introduction here to yourself and um, you know the journey we've been on. Yeah, I, just a pastor of Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church for the last 27 years. Uh, a a full-time resident now of Lancaster, County, and I've been working with this uh, with the law firm here for the last year and a half, just about uh, trying to talk about things that most people do not want to talk about, even though people are interested in it. And that's talking about race relations and those kind of things, and, and those things that go along with it, as well as looking at the history of where we've been as Americans. Unfortunately, uh, Dr. Brown can't be with us tonight, so we have called in the, 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 the reinforcements. We need two people to fill the shoes of, of Dr. Brown, so uh, Lynn Crow and, and Bonnie Bolton are going to be also participating. Uh, Lynn, do you want to quick introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm a recent uh, uh, relocator to Lancaster County. But for the last three years, uh, my wife and I have been attending Bethel, and we've uh, loved it and love this uh, area. And but especially, I appreciate this subject, uh, taking on the history of segregation and discrimination uh, buried in the Constitution as well as in the laws that have unfolded from it. Uh, welcome, everybody. And Bonnie, you want to introduce yourself? All right, Bonnie Bolton. I am an estate paralegal at Gibble, Crable, and Hess, and that is how I got involved. But uh, I would say that primarily I became interested because of uh, someone who has become a dear friend, Kathleen Anderson, who I began to talk with and had my eyes open a little bit to just how ignorant I was. Uh, and uh, I'm thankful for that. And so I've just been uh, in enjoying the education I've received through the seminars and very much enjoying the interaction in the small groups uh, that we have here through the GKH seminars every other month. We have a small group where we go a little bit deeper. So I would encourage uh, all of you who are interested to come and join us at those as well. Thank you, everyone. Um, Chief Bay, since we're doing introductions and we're honored to have you here, would you mind just uh, giving us a little introduction? 
Good evening, everyone. Uh, Chief John Bay, currently the uh, Chief of Police for the Lancaster City Bureau of Police. Uh, I onboarded in December as the interim chief and then was uh, fortunate and blessed to be selected as the permanent chief in June of uh, this year. Uh, I have a very extensive law enforcement uh, background. I retired after over 25 years with the Pennsylvania State Police. Uh, and then I was chief of police for a, a borough uh, for two and a half years. Uh, and then um, longtime military person, just retired out of the, the United States Air Force, uh, Air National Guard and Reserves after a 35 year career. Uh, I've been involved uh, in numerous statewide discussions with respect to uh, you know, demographic changes, the impact of demographic changes in rural Pennsylvania, uh, you know, with the rising Hispanic population and the impact that it has on those uh, very entitled communities and the uproar uh, that resulted. Um, I've talked all over the state in schools and in colleges and communities and held town halls. And just recently, uh, last week, I attended a, a, a five day um, I guess, seminar, if you will, but training on, uh, you know, the disparate impact of uh, the disparate impact that the juvenile justice system has on uh, youths of color, the disp disproportionate contact, they call it, used to call it disproportionate minority contact. Um, so that was a, a, a great week of training. Uh, it really caused some people to look at themselves in the mirror. People were crying. Uh, there were some epiphanies uh, from a few of the uh, uh, European or white participants, and uh, it, was, it was great training. It was great training. So now the work starts. Thank so you, thank Chief. you for the an invitation. Well, thank you for your service. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Um, just a reminder uh, that the reason we've started this journey of looking at the history of slavery and discrimination in this country um, was that we wanted to understand uh, our history and our roots so we could take that information and be transformative in our own lives in what we do and uh, understand what's currently happening and hopefully be able to make a difference. Um, and Reverend Bailey, uh, is going to talk a little more about Sankofa and, and what the roots of that. Tonight's seminar is going to involve kind of two pieces. I'm going to just do, I'm going to try and take 10, 15 minutes, and we're going to do a speed review of the history. Because one of the things that we talked about was um, we went over a lot of the history and you hear it once, but then you kind of forget about the history when we started doing some additional focused topics. So uh, this is going to be a refresher course. <laughs> and then Reverend Bailey is going to present on the uh, history of policing. Um, just a reminder that there's going to be a small group session October 20th that will talk about policing. If you haven't listened to the podcast that uh, was mentioned in the email blast, please do that in advance of this uh, small group session and, and sign up for the small group session. All right, here we go. I'm going to try and do this in about 10 minutes. But um, as you may recall, the, uh, the slave trade uh, went in a triangle from Europe to Western Africa. Uh, where manufactured goods were taken and traded for uh, enslaved Africans that were then put on ships across the Middle Passage, which was the Atlantic, which was a brutal passage uh, over to uh, North America and the Caribbean, where they were uh, traded there for raw materials, which went back to Europe. 1619 is the date that first enslaved Africans arrived in the North American colonies. Uh, and by, um, uh, you know, the establishment of the 13 colonies, all colonies had enslaved Africans. Chattel slavery was 
a brutal enterprise. Uh, it involved um, weapons and, and devices of torture. Uh, and it was very um, inhumane. And it's hard to understand how savage uh, and how humans could treat each other that way. These are just a few examples of some of the, the things that were used to uh, put enslaved Africans in, in, in different types of, uh, they use different things to control them and inflict pain uh, in terms of how they were treated. Um, during the colonies, there were things called, that were called slave codes uh, that were adopted. Uh, one of the things that you hear tonight about um, slave patrols that were used to control slaves to be sure that um, slaves that would try to escape were captured. Um, when you look at our founding of our country and the Constitutional Convention of 1787, our country was founded on a, on a constitution that protected the system of slavery. So we talked about the three-fifths compromise that's uh, put into our constitution, the slave trade clause, uh, which basically allowed the slave trade to continue uh, until the early 1800s, the fugitive slave clause, which said that if slaves escaped from one state and went to another, that under the constitution, you had the right to go to another state and bring back an enslaved person. And we've talked about the electoral college and how that was designed in many ways to protect Southern slaveholding states to allow them to basically uh, prevent uh, the elimination or challenges to uh, the system of slavery. There was the expansion of the country westward. And as the country expanded westward, there was this ongoing division and debate and controversy over whether new territories would be free or allow for uh, slavery. And the federal government was trying to walk this fine line of saying, well, you know, the Missouri Compromise said if, if the free territory was above a certain uh, latitude or longitude, uh, then it was free. And if it was below, it was uh, allowed to be a slave state. And this became so tenuous and so divisive that it began to lead to tensions that eventually led to the Civil War. You see a picture here on the right of Dred Scott. The United States Supreme Court issued a decision in Dred Scott that basically said, Mr. Scott, because he was African uh, descent and black, did not have the right to go into federal court because the constitution did not consider him a citizen. And uh, so the Supreme Court basically said he had no right to go in and challenge uh, anything in federal court. That uh, eventually led to the Civil War, which was uh, based on slavery. Uh, seven Southern states seceded to form the Confederate States of America, four more states then joined. And uh, the Civil War ended when the Confederate States surrendered in 1865. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was, was uh, killed and his vice president, Andrew Johnson, took over. Um, Andrew Johnson was a, a strict segregationist. Um, fortunately, there was a Congress that was intent on making fundamental change to the country, led by our own Thaddeus Stevens uh, from Lancaster. And this enters a period called Reconstruction, which was the effort by the federal government to reintegrate the 4 million newly freed enslaved people, often referred to as the second founding, because it's so important in terms of the history of this country. This lasted for about 12 years. Um, and it involved the um, uh, amendment to our constitution, three critical amendments, the 13th amendment, 
which uh, abolished slavery. We'll talk a little bit about that. 14th Amendment, which granted equal protection and certain rights to all citizens. And then the 15th Amendment, which prohibited denying folks the right to vote based on race. Reconstruction saw an amazing opportunity for the many of the 4 million freed, uh, uh, formerly slaved African uh, Americans to gain political, social, and economic uh, opportunities that they never had before. And you saw uh, many, many Black, uh, would have only been men that, at that time, uh, elected to state legislative bodies and to, and to Congress at the federal level. I just wanna highlight for tonight's seminar, the, the 13th Amendment and the exception to the 13th Amendment. So the 13th Amendment abolished slavery, but I highlighted the exception, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted. Um, and Southern states quickly recognized what many consider was a loophole in the 13th Amendment. There was a concerted attack on reconstruction and freedom. There were black codes, convict leasing, uh, white violence. The KKK came out of this time frame and there was a lot of resistance to um, the, the, the period of reconstruction. Uh, Reconstruction ends in a disputed presidential election. It, it starts a new period of time that's often referred to as the Jim Crow era. Um, there's some Supreme Court decisions during the Jim Crow era, era that lay the foundation really for the next 60, 70 years. One is Plessy v. Ferguson that basically the Supreme Court said under our constitution, it was constitutional to have separate but equal facilities. That was the green light for states to adopt discriminatory laws that separated blacks and whites and treated blacks as second-class citizens. And you saw this, uh, this attack on all aspects of uh, African-Americans' lives, particularly on voting rights. Uh, so there was an attack that basically shut blacks out from, from voting from Reconstruction until the Voting Rights Act in the 1960s. There was attacks on every aspect of uh, a black individual's uh, liberties and rights from housing to employment, to medical care, to where you could be buried. From birth to death, there were laws on the books that treated blacks differently. Um, and it was, you know, uh, it was blatant and across the board. Um, it got so bad in the South that many Black families decided that they could no longer take it. And this started a period called the Great Migration, where many Blacks left the South to go to the North and to the West, to cities to find employment and uh, they were looking for more opportunities and hopefully better treatment. Uh, as we know, if you listen to the podcast, what they found in many of these cities was anything but better treatment. It was uh, oftentimes the same or could even be worse. Then in the 1950s to the 1970s, we, we move into the civil rights movement, sometimes referred to as the second reconstruction. Um, and this was um, a active time of protest of people standing up, seeking change. Uh, we had Brown v. Board of Education was a Supreme Court decision that said, basically overturned Plessy v. Ferguson and said that separate but equal cannot, is not constitutional and it's inherently unequal. Um, there was, again, a consistent backlash and uh, fighting against these types of attempts to make change and to, to make progress. So you had the Southern Manifesto, which was a concerted effort to resist any type of 
desegregation, any type of change that would allow blacks to have civil liberties and rights, just like uh, white people had. Uh, 1950s and 1960s, we covered all kinds of events, Rosa Park, the March on Washington, Little Rock Nine, Woolworth sit-ins, um, you know, it, it, it was just a lot of activity where people were trying to make change. It finally led to federal laws that changed a lot of what was happening through these discriminatory laws. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 dealt with employment. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 ended those state laws that prevented uh, Blacks from voting. The Fair Housing Act made it illegal to say you couldn't um, rent to a Black family or a Black family couldn't live in a certain neighborhood. So this, these federal laws helped to address the widespread private and local discrimination that had been going on since Reconstruction. And then we get to the last um, you know, 40, 50 years, 1970 to 2020, um, we have the assassination of Martin Luther King. We have the 1968 presidential election where you know, George Wallace was still supporting racial segregation and received almost 15% of the vote. Richard Nixon wins by a major, a, a very slim uh, margin. Um, we see white people moving out of many of the cities to urban areas. Uh, there's a period that where there is a focus on the war on drugs and the beginning of mass incarceration. We talked about the, the federal crime bill that uh, criminalized uh, a lot of behavior in a disproportionate manner um, resulted in the building of new prisons, a lot more police officers with mandatory sentences that ended up putting a lot of young black men into prison uh, for a long time. And finally, um, there has been over the last 10 years, just case after case of uh, unfortunate and very discouraging incidents involving uh, people of color, young black people that have been killed in encounters with the police. Uh, and this just highlights some of those that I'm sure many of you know about. Um, and of course we know about George Floyd uh, just last summer and how that led to uh, you know, renewed discussion on racial justice. So that's my quick, quick review. Um, I'm going to stop that there. And while I get the other one loaded, I don't know, Reverend Bailey or Lynn or Bonnie, if you have any comments on anything there. I think it was a good review and it, uh, it sets the stage to focus on the issue of police because as we're gonna see, uh, it wasn't just private control of enslaved workers, but there was a social contract that provided um, essentially police services to maintain the institution of slavery. And that has been replicated and replicated again and again in different eras. And we can see it in our own uh, environment today. I lived in Philadelphia for 50 years and I see evidences of that same system reflected in the city of Philadelphia. Reverend Bailey, I think I'll turn it over to you then. Yeah, I, I think that all the laws that you talked about, you know, people wonder why things remain the same and the one thing that has remained the same and 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 enforced all these laws has been the policing system that we have in america which is little known to people that um you can trace the history of the policing system in america and racial profiling and they go together 
uh, in the history of America. And uh, a lot of times the police get a bad rap, uh, but they're just upholding what the social policies of America. And that's why they were put together. So what do we know? Next slide, please. In the United States, roughly one in every 1,000 black men can expect to be killed over the course of life. One out of three Amer African-American boys born today, this is today, can be expected to be sentenced to prison compared to 1, 6, 1 of six Latino and one of 17 white males. African-Americans and other color groups, groups of color are significantly more likely to be killed than their peers of the white community. Police violence is one of the leading, leading causes of black male deaths. And when we look at those things, we have to realize that it, it's, it's, it's never been skin, it's always been sin, but in America, skin is the sin, and uh, which is sad. We know 13% of all people commit crimes, but yet African-Americans carry the heavier weight uh, than any other group in America. Next slide, please. They're more than twice, the, twice the likely to be unarmed when killed during encounters with police, which you know, is very sad as white people, according to that investigation by the Guardians, which is a group of black officers uh, who belong to their own American African-American police order, uh, that black men are killed, mostly, uh, most of them are unarmed, which is just crazy. And it's so costly to America that you would think that people would stop and say, this here kind of policing is costing us. And when you see that people won't change, even when it costs, it tells you how deeply ingrained this whole craziness is. For example, in, in, in New York, it costs them $175.9 million in civil claims. And in and Chicago was 500 million between two, 2004 and 2014. That doesn't make any sense that that kind of money is willfully spent on uh, police misconduct and nobody seems to be bothered by that. By the price alone, you would think that people would say, wait a minute, there's something wrong with this system that's costing us so much money uh, that we would want to do something to make a change. Next slide, please. Uh, a black male is five times more likely to be stopped without just cause than a white person, and twice as likely as a black female. 65% of African American adults have been targeted because of their race. Similarly, 35% of Latino and Asian adults have felt the same. 87% of African American adults say the US justice system is more unjust towards black people. And here's the sticker, 61% of white Americans agree. So if that many Americans agree, you think we'd be able to bring about a change. And you have to ask yourself, if the majority of Americans believe that this is an unjust system, why isn't it changed? And I'm not gonna be able to answer all that tonight. I'm just a novice. And uh, forgive me for just being an amateur historian, but you would think that people would stop and say, this is just costing us too much in taxpayer dollars, especially in an America where people seem to always be concerned about taxes. Well, why would you wanna pay for something that we could actually uh, do away with? Next slide, please. How did we get here? And, 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 and it's, we use the term Sankofa, which is an African word from the Aiken tribe in Ghana. The literal translation of the word and the symbol is, it's not taboo to fetch what is at risk of being left behind. You have so many Americans today who do not want to look backwards. And if we don't look backwards and grab the facts from the past, we won't know how to move forward. And the quest for knowledge among the Aiken was with the implication that the quest is based on critical examination and intelligent and patient investigation. The knowledge of the past must never be forgotten. How do we get here? There's a 2014, 2014 study named The Essence of Innocence 
provides evidence that police officers' differential treatment of Black people, particularly youth, is rooted in beliefs that Black people are inherently more violent than non-Black people. The humanity of Black people has been under attack since the tragedy of the Middle Passage. That whole concept has not changed since Africans came to this shore, that somehow we're, we're less than human and somehow we have a more criminal element. I, you know, it amazes me. I, you see how good I look and how well I dress. I can get out of my nice car in the parking lot and there are still people who will look at me and make sure their car is locked even though my car looks better than theirs and I'm better dressed than them. It's amazing just seeing a black face to believe that somehow I'm a bigger criminal or the biggest criminal, I know I'm six or 10, so I'm a large criminal that they're meeting in the parking lot. It's amazing that it still happens today. Next slide, please. Hey, Reverend Bailey, can I just emphasize one of the points there, which is, the our the history of our country definitively um, exposes an intentional attempt by white America to use propaganda, science, uh, mass media, politics, every type of institution to spread this notion about. Um, Black people that Reverend Bailey's talking about, that they're violent, they're less educated, less smart. And this, this was an intentional effort after Reconstruction to justify these disparate laws and treatment. So, you know, this isn't something that just kind of organically happened. This was an intentional effort to use science, to use mass media, to use the arts, everything to characterize Blacks in a way that justified unequal treatment. And that carries forward today. Yeah, and, and I would argue that, that you know, the history of American modern policing goes back uh, centuries. It's a confluence of the watch groups in the northern colonies and the slave patrols in the southern colonies. And I'll, and I'll try to just, uh, explain those a little later. The watch groups in the north were modeled after the system used in England in which volunteers from the community were charged primarily with the warning of such dangers as fire, crime, maintaining order, and controlling enslaved and free African people. You want to use the next slide, please? And, and to be fair, it, it, and I want to be that, it recognized as with the English system, uh, Northern policing mainly was used heavily against labor unions, large waves of, waves of Catholic, Irish, Italians, Chinese, German, and Eastern Europeans, and drove the call of law and order to benefit the interests of those of the dominant culture and class. And it was mainly built to police the poor in the original 13 colonies. So it wasn't always just black people that the police system was built for. It was also built to, admit to, to, to be against any marginalized groups that came into the country. And uh, when you study and you look at some of the studies that have been shown, they will show you how that was done, that they will use marginalized groups against another marginalized groups and another marginalized group to keep people in check but it was always to maintain the power at the top, always to keep those folk who were in control to keep them in control. Next, next slide, please. Slave patrols, which is something that policing, uh, uh, American policing is based, its, its roots are based upon, started in 1704 as part of the 13 original colonies. And I want to say that again, because so often people think policing uh, that was used against African-Americans only was in the South. And somewhere we need to get away from that notion that it only was began in the South, that the fear of, of uprising and the fear of resistance by Black folk was also in the North. People forget there was slavery in the North. 
And somehow, whenever we talk about slavery, it's always like it's in the South. And that, you know, in the North, they didn't have those problems. It was in the North as well. And here's the thing that I found most interesting in looking at this. Almost all white males of military age between 21 and 45 had to serve regardless of economic or social position. So it didn't matter whether you was rich or whether you were poor, whether you were a landowner. And, 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 and the reason why this is an important and critical fact, because what it did, it brought white folk together, no matter what social standing they had in the country. So you were poor white, you were a rich white, you were all together in this one thing called either the militia or slave patrol. And the reason why they, and they brought them together and the reason why they brought them together was to, because of the fear of uprising and the enslaved African. So you had white people all on the same page, even though they still were not on the same economic level, which is, you know, it, it, it is a, a root of white supremacy as well in America. So white people, no matter who they were, as long as they were in those age groups, could be used in this slave patrol. And, and you had to be a part of it, otherwise you were fined if you did not become a part of the slave patrol. And you know, rich people can always figure a way they'll pay the fine rather than be a part. But if you were poor, you had to be a part of these slave patrols. Next slide, please. They were tasked with maintaining the economic and social order of the day. And what people do not want to admit in America, slavery was the highest and the richest economic piece that we had in America. And what the slave patrols were out to do was to protect that economic interest of America. As a matter of fact, South Carolina, Charleston was the richest city in America during the enslavement. The South controlled the economics of America at that time, not the industrialized revolution, all that kind of stuff. It was the economic wealth that came in America was from the enslavement. As a matter of fact, it was so, so rich that there are money, there was money that was printed with the images of enslaved Africans on that money by different states and different corporations. That just tells you the economic power of enslavement that for some reason, when you listen to economists, especially American economists, they do not admit that slavery, how important it was to the economic growth of America that made it the richest nation on the face of the earth. Let me say that again, the richest nation on the face of the earth. And somehow people want to talk about capitalism and they forget all about the enslavement of Africans and the free labor that they were getting that allowed America to be so rich. Uh, the acceptance and along with the slave patrols came the acceptance of, of the belief in the criminalization of the free and the enslaved African. So not only was the enslaved African seen as suspect, the free African was seen as suspect as well. And these slave patrols could enter into the home of a black or a white person, did not matter, without any evidence, they could just knock on your door and enter in your door seeking what they thought was enslaved that may have escaped or may, may have been planning a rebellion or whatever they thought, they could do that, uh, could go into your house. And uh, they had that right and that power and that authority. Uh, they were also there to, uh, to, to watch, to catch, enforce curfews, and to control the behavior and movement of free and enslaved Africans. So even free African Americans, free, they were not Americans then, free Africans could not move wherever they wanted to move. Uh, they had to have either permission by somebody else. One of the things you'll see when we started the church, Bethel, I wasn't here, I may be old enough to be here, but when Bethel started the church, they had to ask permission to build a church here in Lancaster. They had to ask permission. So even free Africans could not move wherever they wanted to move without running into what was the police state that for them, uh, they could not move, they could not go anywhere. And African, enslaved Africans had to have a pass and they have a written pass to say that they can move wherever they want to move. So it was there to limit the movement of Africans uh, to keep them from going where they wanted to go, uh, the police were used for that. Next slide, please. 
And it was the, the slave codes, what, what the police were enforcing. And what uh, we talked about a couple of the laws that was on the books, but there were also laws put, that were put on the books. And this is what the slave codes, listen to what it says, devising the principle that Negroes and slaves are wholly unqualified to be governed by the laws of the nation and need a special set of rules for regulating and ordering. These codes came into effect in America in the late 1600s, gave the right to punish and even kill offending persons. So stop and think about that. That people thought that the African and the Negroes who were called Negroes and what so many people don't understand, Negro just means black in Spanish. So the black person in America, they didn't believe that the laws that were on the books for the Americans could register, regulate and order those Africans. So they had to come up with new rules and new laws, uh, codes rather, they were called slave codes that would regulate these people. Just imagine, it was not, we were never as African-Americans were never expected to be regulated by the laws of the land. Uh, they had to have a separate codes that were there to regulate and, 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 and keep the order among African-Americans. And I want you to rem remember that because if I forget it, it it's hasn't gone away. And, and that's something that we uh, don't talk about often. Uh, next slide, please. If I'm going too fast, uh, tell me because I'm trying to rush through these because I want to give people time if you want a question or have a question. Uh, the Black Codes enacted immediately after the American Civil War through varying from state to state were all intended to secure a steady supply of cheap labor. You had to have, as a Black person, you had to have, after the Civil War, you have to have written evidence of employment. And if you didn't have that, you were taken into custody because you were presumed to be a person who was uh, just standing around. For, for the lack of me, I can't think of the word that wants to come to mind. And what it was used for was to continue the, the, the work of slavery. They didn't want the labor people to move, black folk to move who were free laborers. So they put these codes into place that limited even further the African-American from moving. And you know, I still have people in my congregation who are old enough to remember when their parents could not leave wherever they were living, even though they were free in America. I mean, we're talking about in the 1900s. We're not talking about in the 1800s. Could not just get up and walk away. Could not even get up and leave. That freedom was not theirs. And part of it was because they assumed the inferiority of black folk, even the freed slave. And mainly in the South was enforced by the government sponsored police and citizen vigilante groups. And those vigilante groups were the Ku Klux Klan and other groups that, that had the power of policing African Americans. They could string them up, hang them, hang them, could do all kinds, brand them, all kinds of harsh things. And, and, and I want you to hear me clearly tonight. I'm not blaming the police. I'm blaming the society that we live in, who have used the police to do what the society wants to have done, either spoken or unspoken, and that all the brunt of it falls on the police, which is a shame before God. Uh, but that's uh, something else. Next slide, please. Hey, Reverend Bailey, can I just make the link that the Black Codes attempted to to uh, exploit the loophole in the 13th Amendment. So the 13th Amendment, remember, has that exception that it eliminates slavery except as a punishment for crime. So states saw that as an opportunity to basically adopt black codes. And uh, if you didn't have a job, if you were loitering, if, uh, you know, for whatever reason, you did something that um, violated one of these petty codes that had been adopted, you were arrested, put in jail, and then leased to your formal white master to be enslaved again. 
it was basically reenacting slavery through this loophole in the 13th Amendment by taking, adopting these black codes and then using those to arrest people and incarcerate them. Yeah, yeah, yeah and that's an important thing to, to, to realize. I, I meant to say something about that, the 13th Amendment, which, you know, well, uh, there's always, you know, it always amazes me. You can put a law on the books and somebody will figure a way to get around it. Uh, the Black, here's an example of the Black Code. Be it further enacted, all freemen, free Negroes, and mulattoes in the state over the age of 18 years, found on the second Monday in January 1866, or thereafter with no lawful employment or business, or found unlawfully assembling themselves together, either in the day or nighttime, and all white persons so assembling with freemen, free Negroes or mulattoes, or unusually associating with freemen, free Negroes or mulattoes, on the terms of equality or living in adultery or fornication with a free woman, free Negro or mulatto should be deemed vagrants. So you can see how broad that law is, that if you are found without lawful employment, lawful employment meant you had to have a written uh, document that stated you were working with someone. Um, it's, you know, a lot of us got our last names from the plantation that our parents and foreparents worked on. And, and, and you better, uh, you better say I'm I'm Bailey, I'm ba I, be I belong to the Bailey uh, plantation or something like that. If you didn't have one of those um, written documents to be able to move around, you could be arrested and lost in your freedom. And some of that um, convict leasing of African Americans were used, as the white said, you'd be right back on a plantation working for free. And sometimes you didn't even end up on the plantation. The prison system would lease you out. They would lease black folks out to planters and others. And it, there's a book called Worse Than Slavery. And it really talks about how Africans who before the Civil War, you had a owner who could fight for you. But after the Civil War, there was nobody who could speak up to you so for you. So if you were ended up in prison on the convict leasing, you could be there for the rest of your life. Uh, the conditions were worse than enslavement. Uh, so that I, I didn't believe until I read the book or this work called Worse Than Slavery. It's an excellent book. But these are some of the black code examples. Next slide. Uh, Jim Crow laws is the next one that came after the Civil War as well. They were in operation. <clears throat> what most people don't understand is that the Jim Crow laws mainly were operating mainly in the North. In the South, it was common for Black folk and white folk to live together. They may not have had social contact. They may not have went to the same churches, but generally they lived in the same vicinity together. Uh, as a matter of fact, Africans in the beginning, before the Civil War, outnumbered white people in the South. So. But, but Jim Crow laws really became in effect in, in, in the North. And these are state and local statutes that legalize racial segregation, marginalized African-Americans, took away their right to vote, hold jobs, to organize, demonstrate, and other citizen rights and opportunities. And those who attempted to defy such laws faced arrest, fine, jail, violence, and even death. And the police were used to make sure that these laws were respected. And, 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 and it was not the police fault. This is what the society expected of them and used the police to do. So next slide, please. Here's an example of uh, some of the Jim Crow laws that policemen were asked to enforce. It should be unlawful for a Negro and white person to play together or in the company with each other at any game or pool or billets. Can you imagine uh, that police had to go into, if they caught somebody playing billet pool together, a white and a black person, they could be arrested for that. Well, mainly the black person would be arrested. Every employer of white or Negro males should provide for such white or Negro males reasonably accessible and separate toilet facilities. Uh, I know African Americans who are even alive today who would have been arrested for using a water fountain. 
would have been arrested for using a white uh, toilet facility, would have been arrested to sit in a white seat on a bus. Uh, these, uh, who did they use to do this? Not normal citizens, it was policemen that they would use. The police force would be used. It should be unlawful for any amateur colored baseball team to play baseball in any vacant lot or baseball diamond within, a two, within two blocks of any playground devoted to the white race. Police were used to make sure this didn't happen. Can you imagine police got to make sure that the black kids don't play on the white kids playground uh, that the police were called, it was a criminal uh, fence that was used. Next slide, please. The problematic great migration, because everybody wants to talk about policing in the South and make it so bad that they were, you know, what was going on in the South and, and how bad it was. But what, what really happened with the great migration, the cover was finally pulled off of the North because the North was always acting like it was so pro-Black that they couldn't understand how the white South could be so racist. That was what the North taught and that's what the North thought about himself. But the great migration actually showed the secret that was in the North, that the North was as racist as the South. They just didn't have the opportunities that the Southerns had because there wasn't as many blacks in the North as in the South. And so the great migration caused a problem because of how, 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 how difficult it was for Africans to live in the South because of the criminality, criminalization of black people in the South for just about everything. There was a thing called, you couldn't even look at a white woman, you could be arrested and some people could be hung for that. People were afraid for their young black males because they knew that young black males could be, could disappear. Uh, as a matter of fact, I try to tell my folk at the church, why do black folk always, were always in church on Sunday, especially in the South? Because it was the safest place to be on Sunday because Sunday, was the number one day for lynching in the South, where people would go to church on Sunday morning and get riled up about something about a black person, and they'd come out and the first black person they found would be lynched. So if you if you wanted to be safe, you better be in church on Sunday morning. You better not be caught on the road by yourself. You better not be caught out in the street playing somewhere. Didn't matter what age you were. So because of the horrendous a lifestyle that black folk faced in the South. It was this great migration where black people left the South in droves, in droves were forced out. Next slide, please. It was a movement of 6 million African-Americans or more, because what people need to understand is that we, not, we were not always counted in the census. So we really don't know how many black people got up and moved but at least 6 million moved from rural areas of the Southern United States to urban areas in the Northern states between 1916 and 1970. By 1970, nearly half of all African-Americans lived in Northern cities. Economic exploitation was the other reason that they moved. Social terror, political disenfranchise, disenfranchisement. It was caused primarily by the poor economic condition as well as the prevalent racial segregation and discrimination and hostility that was in the Southern states. So blacks move. Next slide. What they did not know as they moved, that what they caught in the South, they would start catching in the North. Interaction between African-Americans in the Northern city, police departments was initially shaped by the great migration. So. The whole idea and concept of what the Northern City Police Departments became was based on all these new black folk moving into the North. And most white communities, including white police departments, were unaccustomed to the presence of African-Americans. Let me say that again. In the North, most white communities and white police were unaccustomed to the presence of African-Americans. 
and they reacted to the increasing numbers with fear, hostility, attitudes that were exacerbated by deeply ingrained racist stereotypes. You heard Dwight say that people use science, they use history, they use all kinds, religion was used as well to promote this idea of the inferiority and the criminalization of black people. I wish one day we could talk about uh, how the church has promoted racism in America. But all that happened when blacks moved to the North, uh, this exacerbated the, uh, exacerbated the conflict between blacks and whites and the black police officers that was used as a buffer between the white community and the black community because of the fear that whites have and still have in many play cases uh, for black people. I'm almost through, next slide. And what they were reflecting, the beliefs of many whites, Northern police departments acted upon the presumption that African-Americans, especially African-American men, possessed an inherent tendency toward criminal behavior, one that required constant surveillance of African-Americans and restrictions of their movements in the interest of white slavery. And one of the things in one of the podcasts, if you will listen to it by NPR, they talk about what happened during prohibition. Prohibition became an equal opportunist a criminalization of white people. So there was all kinds of people selling liquor. Uh, police were involved in helping the uh, uh, partnership with many of the people who were, boot, who were bootleggers and everything else. And it just was running, crime was running rampant in America and they couldn't control it. But guess who the, got the brunt of the blame for crime in America was the black community. Uh, and many of the speakeasies and those things that were run by white folk were placed in black communities. Uh, that's what the, you go check on the Harlem Renaissance and all that. You'll find out that many of the speakeasies that were run by white criminals were, were placed in black communities. Shut up, Reverend. According to by the mid 1950s, many urban police departments had implicitly reconceived their missions as essentially that of policing African-Americans, protecting whites against blacks. I can remember as a child, a teenager, uh, walking to a white community with some of my friends going to the mall. And then we were stopped by the police officer asking us what we were doing in that neighborhood. Now, there was no way for us to get from the school that I was going to and the mall without walking through this neighborhood, but yet we were stopped. And the other thing that happened, uh, uh, I can expressly remember, is I worked in landscaping and white gentlemen used to run around in uh, swim trunks and no shirt on while they were cutting grass. But I couldn't walk around with my shirt unbuttoned. A cop would stop me and tell me to button up my shirt. So this whole stuff of protecting whites against blacks has been uh, ingrained in the American policing system. Next slide, please. Even after World War II, when black men had went into the service and fought for freedoms of America, supposedly fighting for freedom on other shores, dying in a war, came back believing things would be changed for them when they came back to America. Well, what happened? For a variety of reasons, the incidents of police brutality against African-Americans became more frequent and more intense throughout the country in decades following World War II. That's why I was saying earlier, the police are really there to keep the values of the society intact. Black Americans who begin to assert their formal uh, rights and liberties, demanding that they be respected by local governments, judiciaries, and law enforcement agencies. Uh, that was a reason that uh, they faced this aftermath the migration of rural whites to nearby cities. Many of the rural whites didn't live in the cities then. And they began coming to the cities in search of better employment opportunities, met the Africans who were already living there in those communities. That was another cause of police brutality. And in other cities, especially in the North, the flight of whites to the suburbs and the natural growth of, of their communities meant that policing, all white policing now was in the city, in the communities that were predominantly black. 
So if you went into Harlem, the people would be black and all the police officers would be white. And in almost every black community experienced that where the police force was predominantly white and, and the people who they were policing were black. Next slide, please. Notwithstanding the variety, the variety of American groups, uh, I, I, what I'm saying is policing is American problem, even though people want to make it a black person's problem. It's not my problem. It's an American problem. And people need to understand it's been an American problem since its inception. Uh, the variety of, among groups that have been subjected to police brutality in the United States, the great majority of victims have been African American. In this estimation, the most expert or key factor explaining the predominance of African Americans among victims of police brutality is anti-Black racism among members of mostly white police departments. As, and I, I'm amazed that it's even being allowed now in, in our, in our, in our uh, army, uh, our, our, our war forces. Similar prejudices are thought to have played a role in police brutality committed against other historically oppressed or marginalized groups. So it haven't been only black people, it's an American problem. Next slide, please. Some solutions, America must decide what type of policing is wanted. Uh, I picked this up as professionals, officers possessing both passion and perspective. Officers who want to be police officers, not because they wanna beat heads, not because they don't like a certain group, not because of any other underlying reason, but they have passion and perspective and they wanna uh, be police officers because it's the love of their life and they like people. The second one are enforcers. These are officers possessing passion but have no perspective. So they walk into a community, they have no understanding of the people there. They have no perspective about why they are even in policing. And they're not they uh, the uh, they're not the best police officer. Reciprocators, officers perspect possessing perspective, but lacking possession, but lacking passion. Rather, they they can they have they 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 have a perspective of why they're a police officer, but there's no passion behind it. And the worst are the avoiders, officers who have neither passion nor perspective. And we need to decide. You know, I'd rather have professionals people who decided they wanted to be police officers, not based on a test. Because what the test has done, people who failed in other areas end up in the police department because of the pay and they can't find that pay anywhere else. Well, I wouldn't want them to be police officers if that's not the desire in the heart to obey the law and to keep the law for other people. Next slide, please. Possible reforms, and I said it earlier, so all we've been doing, everything I looked at, is something I found striking was it said that all the reforms that people have brought about, none of them have stuck, none of them have actually been in place. And we basically are facing the same things today that we were facing 50 years, 100 years ago. So what do we need to do? Unbiased studies of policing in America. We need people to study police departments without bias, and figure out what needs to happen and what needs to be done. And we need to stop asking the police and the police unions to fix themselves. They're not gonna fix themselves. The other thing we need is citizen police boards, real citizen police boards that have teeth in them, that are speaking into the lives of the police department and giving the police what they want in their community rather than the police department deciding what they wanna to do to keep that community. And finally, the removal of police immunity. I think it's a shame before God that you can be immune even if you broke the law and you did something that was uh, unlawful to another person of another community. Police immunity ought to be taken off the board. I don't know any job, uh, you know, people keep saying, how do you make the police better? Enable the, fire, enable the chief to be able to fire any police officer that's not living up to the code of the police department that he's running. I tell you, firing people is a good method of reform. And I guarantee you, 
we could change things if we would be able to remove police uh, remove immunity. I think that was the last slide. Thank you, Reverend Bailey. Excellent presentation. Uh, I'm going to start with with Lynn and Bonnie first to see if you have any thoughts, reflections, comments, and then um, we'll be open for some questions from the broader group. Um, the NPR podcast today, I, I only got the link last night, but uh, I was very much struck by uh, something that Reverend Bailey said and tied in. It's it's an issue of the indifference of the society, of the people at large. Um, I, I liked the way he, he repeatedly said, this is how we used the police to you know, uh, enact these laws that were created to keep certain groups in power. Um, I think it's in our nature to want to be above, want to be bet higher than somebody else. And um, it very much strikes me that uh, it's about power and how from the beginning of our country, it was about power. Uh, even the electoral college, you know, being created so that the people of power, economic power wanted to be sure that the people that they wanted were elected. And, uh, and so again, until we can get a country, our country and the people of our country to face the fact that white people uh, think that they're better and, and, and are fearful of black people for whatever reason. Um, and we start to tear down those uh, things in our hearts and, and be willing to admit those things um, before, you know, that we're gonna be able to tear down what's going on with the police. Uh, it's very easy for us to say, it's the police's fault you know, not so much the bad apple theory, but even just systemically, it's the police. Well, it is the police, but it's us because we're willing to tolerate that. Um, and, and again, I, so I was just uh, taken with the idea and nauseated as per usual uh, by the idea that it's us that allows these things to go on. They don't just, it's not somebody else letting it happen. It's us as individuals that allow these things that, to continue. And I'll just echo uh, something of what Bonnie said. Uh, it's, it's such a relevant issue today. Uh, when the country at large recognizes the problem, but Congress cannot bring together a, ref uh, a bill and get it passed, um, we're, we're at a, stick, a sticking point. And, um, I think I might, um, if it's okay, just kind of pass the mic over to Chief Bay. I was struck by the article in the newspaper today that um, Officer Bay met with our Attorney General yesterday uh, and other police officers to talk about some of these problems and talk about how to recruit people uh, who can who can resolve the sort of social and racial tensions that Reverend Bailey has outlined tonight? Uh, Chief Bay, is there anything you want to say here? Well, I want to thank Reverend Bailey for his very candid uh, presentation, and you know we have to understand that this conversation. Uh, and the depth that this conversation is going into needs to be outside the confines of this presentation. It needs to be common rhetoric and common conversation uh, with respect to a reality check, and 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 leads to, and it will lead to an understanding of where we are today. And Reverend, I appreciate you saying that. You know, I mean, I've been in law enforcement for a long time. Believe me when I tell you, I understand the issues, but I appreciate it when you said that it's not the police fault entirely, that uh, in the cases, in the extreme cases that you cited through the course of history, 
the police were, uh, they were enforcing the law of the land and they were enforcing the expectations of society. And so that's where I believe, you know, I always talk about a partnership between police, police agencies and the communities they serve, that it has to be a partnership. And the, the reconciliation of the communities to, uh, with regard to the history has to be made. That, recon that recognizing and reconciliation has to be uh, apparent and it has to be intentional. You know, this is a lot to unpack uh, during this particular uh, session that we're having. It's a good start. I've been having these conversations for a long time. Um, it's a lot to unpack. And a lot of people are not willing to, you know, peel, the, peel back the onion skin and, and look at really root cause issues and talk about them openly and commit to uh, what it takes to have that reconciliation. So yeah, I appreciated the, the, the AG coming down and speaking with us yesterday about you know, the critical issues of, uh, of um, recruiting, uh, particularly in, in Lancaster. Uh, that is an issue that has been ongoing in law enforcement over the past 10, 15 years actually. And it's really, really beginning to show itself with the emphasis on police departments today, the way it is, you know, especially after the murder of, uh, of George Floyd. So yeah, we have our work cut out for us. It's not impossible. Uh, we'll just continue to, to try to build that trust and that legitimacy in Lancaster City. And, and hopefully it will result in, uh, you know, people from our community actually signing up to uh, become police officers and affect real change internally uh, and, and be in positions to impact and write policy to really affect change. I, I think that the, uh, the, and the reason why I, you know, I'm a Christian, so I have to look at things differently than I you did when I was uh, unsaved. And I think the thing that bothers me the most is that uh, the policing system is used as a black and white issue. But if you check it out historically, I mean, it's been against unions. It's been used against Kent State where white students were killed. When white protesters came out, only, only time it really wasn't used is this last time, January 6th. But other than that, anytime whites have tried to move themselves from poverty, from the from the uh, from the uh, uh, um, from wherever they are in their social standing, uh, the police department has been used against them. And it's amazing to me that people only think it's for black folk. But once you say black, because they've used whites from every social strata to hold black folk down, whites don't see where the same system is holding them down. We can't get reform, not because white America doesn't want it, it's because the people in power who own our government, who own our politicians, do not want to see it happen because when that happens, it means America becomes the America that we talked about and dreamt about and that means they have to give up some of the power they have, and they're not going to do that. So they have us fighting over the bones while they run away with the side of beef. And I wish that whites could see just how their children, you, you, you know, in many communities, trailer park communities, are held in a certain light and, and kept there by the police departments that are used by the people in power. And, and, and they're not going to change. I mean, we're not, you're not going to get the recruitment is not going to change. If they wanted to recruit more people, they could get them. They could, just like they've done in everything else, we can do it. If we make our mind up to do it, we could, we, we could do it. Some one way to do it, and I'll shut up, is to get rid of that soap, that, that civil, that civil uh, uh, test. Give, get rid of that civil test, and I guarantee you, you'll be able to get more black people and Latinos who care about their communities, 
care about police and do what Chief Bay has been doing, sending his police officers into the community to do volunteer work again, which has not happened for years, but they're coming back in the community, working at the food bank and other places that needs to happen. And if we did that, we'd see a, a whole, a large, matter of fact, and I'll shut up on this, one of the police officers you sent who came to our food bank, Reverend, uh, uh, Reverend Bay, uh, <laughs> Brother Bay. It's, that's called prophecy. One of the <laughs> one of the one of the police officers, he came to our church service and bought his family. Yeah. I mean, yeah, this yeah. is how you this is how you break this craziness. Well, and can, I, can I speak to this just real quick? Uh, something also you mentioned, Reverend Bailey. Listen, policing, we're in the people business. We, we deal with human beings, you know, uh, the civil service test, you're right, does, is not a, uh, an indication of somebody who will be successful uh, in, in, uh, in policing. Uh, we just had a civil service test on September 11th. Uh, I went there, I looked at the test. It's, it's written in a seventh grade level. Uh, so what I did was uh, so, you know, we work within the parameters of the civil service uh, rules and regulations with regard to the process. So you're right. What I did was I moved our oral board interviews from the, from the uh, end of the selection process to right after the written test. And I weighted our oral boards to be more meaningful than a written test. And then I had um, a consultant uh, develop very specific questions that speak to our core values and what we want in a police officer. And also this police psychologist consultant also developed these questions to uh, identify attributes for uh, that successful police officers have. And then I had another consultant review those questions to ensure that they weren't inherently biased. And so, and then that person, uh, conducted implicit bias training for my oral board raiders. So even though we work within the constraints of the civil service commission, or I'm sorry, civil service regulations, there are entry points that chiefs can make an impact, but they gotta be able to see the world through a particular lens and understand what they're doing and what they're up against in order to make those, to make that entry and make those moves. So. But I, I appreciate you, Reverend Bailey. I really do. Thank you. You know, Reverend Bailey, if I could just make an observation, um, having somebody like Chief Bay, first of all, in, you know, in the police ranks and leading a, a department like the city and then being willing to come and listen to this type of uh, forum speaks volumes um, and, um, Thank you, Chief Bay. I've just been, I haven't met you before. I've just been so impressed. And I'm thankful that you're at the city. And um, wow, I wish there was, you know, a thousand more of you we could clone and <laughs> push out there because um, change is not easy. And oh. It's hard work. But um, Thank you for coming tonight and, and speaking and for all that you're doing. I hope you know how much we want to support you. Um, are there other people that have questions, comments? Um, we have about 10 minutes left here and we'd love to hear from, from anybody that's been participating this evening. Yes, I have a question for uh, Chief Bay. Uh, doing your recruitment for new officers, do you uh, do family uh, background checks? Because family, um, yeah, do you do family back checks when you do your officers? We do family background checks? Yes. Like, family can have a great influence, especially if your family, yeah. your family is in the, uh, if you have some families who are drug dealers and, mm -hmm. and uh, running guns and, and drugs and things like that, your family has a big influence on you. Yeah. Well, and if you become an officer, you know, what deals are made, you know? Yeah. So, you know, what you're speaking of kind of uh, fruits from the poisonous tree, right? Yes. Uh, the question is, is the piece of fruit that we pick uh, poisonous? 
Uh, I can tell you that we have the most strict uh, background investigation of any police department in Lancaster County. We have people who did not pass our back backgrounds who are now working in other police departments in, in the county. Very, very strict. Uh, our, back, our background investigators uh, take the position that, you know, the person that they're doing a background on potentially could be riding with them in a car next to them on a, on a patrol. And so the question is, do I want this person in a car next to me? Can I trust this person? Uh, so part of that is looking into their, their fa familial uh, setting, you know, interviewing parents and, and brothers and sisters. Uh, we don't run criminal history checks on them because you're not allowed to unless they're the sub they, unless they consent or they're the subject of an investigation. But oftentimes, certainly with uh, social media, a lot of things are revealed about family members. And then it's up to myself and my command staff to ultimately make a determination if that family member's actions will impede this person from moving forward in the process. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for the question. I have a question, Dwight. Yes, Mary. Um, I wondered if if you or Reverend Bailey or Mr. Bay know at what point the first non-white person took uh, a position in a police department in this country. I don't know the answer to that. I don't either. And uh, uh, part of the thing, part of, uh, you know, when I always hear these things about the first black, uh, and, and usually that's because the door has been closed, is not because they're the first one qualified. Mm -hmm. And so when I see these, you know, uh, statements, well, they're the first black that became president of the college, it was because the college wouldn't allow anybody black who was qualified uh, to be president before that. And the yeah. Another, uh, perhaps not directly related, but you commented about someone speaking of their family uh, during the Great Migration, was it? Um, coming north and so forth. Yeah. That was back in the, uh, what, 1916 to 1970 or something like that. Uh, not, yeah. but, but some of that even, again, you know, we gotta, can't keep seeing the uh that the the dates are exact because no no still, no no there's yeah. still problems going on with people even into the 80s and the and and, and right up into the to, to um, some people have problems in some places even now in communities oh, sure. where, where, where which were once owned by black people in the south have been taken violently from them either through taxes or some kind of law and, and those black folk have had to leave their properties that their grandparents and great grandparents owned. So people are still going through some of the same problems uh, that they had. And so what they would do, if you don't sell the property, then you become a criminal problem. Uh, and uh, the law has been used in that way for many times, too, far too often. I just want to say one last thing to unless the business community gets behind, reform is not gonna happen. Unless the banks that are in Lancaster, unless the law firms that are in Lancaster, unless the leading businesses get behind, the reform is not gonna happen. They have to be the ones to come to the table. And they're the ones that are not at the table. You'll have everybody else at the table, but the, but the police, uh, I mean, but the, uh, powerful business people in our community. If they want change, they will get change and they will make sure change happens. And unless that happens, you know, we're, we're just talking wind here. Other comments, questions? Roger, I think you're on mute. Yes, okay, can you hear me? Yep, sure can. 
Okay. Uh, I had a comment. You were talking about the, the Dred Scott decision. And you had said that uh, it declared that Black people were not citizens, even if they were free and they had no standing in court. Uh, while you were talking, I looked it up on my phone, and it also said that an important part was that uh, they could not prohibit the expansion of slavery into the territories. So I think that's an equally significant part of the Dred Scott decision. Yeah, so that's it, it a good just, point. Uh, and I think was, that, that, yeah, good, that's very helpful to understand. So uh, United States Supreme Court, just as a quick refresher, they're like the final word, they're the, they're, they're the final decision maker on laws and whether they're constitutional or not. And so the country is going through this struggle as it expands westward. What are we going to do with this new territory? Is it going to be free? Is it going to be uh, allowed to have enslaved people? And there's this struggle. And the Supreme Court gets this case about Dred Scott. And part of the case is, can a Black person even get into federal court? Because when you go into court, you need to have what's, what's called standing which is you have some interest that you're allowed to be in there. And part of the decision that I had referred to was the court looked at the constitution that was adopted and it said, well, the founders never intended that black people would be citizens. And in order to have standing in federal court, you need to be a citizen. So hence applying that logic, a black person is not a citizen and doesn't have standing to be in court. But it also looked at this question of can, can the federal government control the expansion westward of whether it can be uh, slavery can be allowed? And the answer was no, it cannot. And I think, Roger, that's what you were pointing out, yeah. which had this slow boil turn into a, a, a really hard boil. And then eventually the Civil War erupted. Because a country just can't live like that. You, you can't draw a line on a map and say, well, north of that, it's free. And south of that, you can have enslaved people. Uh, it's just not, not going to work. So um, thanks for bringing that up. Other comments or questions? Reverend Bailey, do you want to have the last word this evening? Yeah, yeah, I, I hope I, um, I, I'm still dealing with the COVID thing. So my speech, for me, it's a little slurred. And I hope it was not for you. So when I tried to um, say certain words, words, uh, I'm still having some problems. So I hope you, you um, forgive me for that. And I pray you folk are getting vaccinated. Uh, um, and... Uh, but, but I appreciate uh, you, the time that folk are taking to be a part of this. And I, I, I sent out many emails to people to invite them to come and, and be a part of this discussion. This is not the first time I've done that because until we as a people demand first discussion about this, to talk about this, and people are trying to stop even discussion about historical facts. They don't want to know what happened in the past and want to act like everything started today. Uh, until we can talk and have conversation and people are willing to do like Brother Roger did, go and read after. Just don't take what we say as facts, but go and read for yourself and uh, listen to some of the podcasts. Talk to your neighbors. When the Black Lives Matter movement began, I went down south because young white kids came to the city to protest. And I said to them, your protest doesn't mean nothing if you just do it here in the city. You have to go to your own home and in your own community and say the same thing that you're doing here in the city. Because it's easy to leave your home and come and talk about it somewhere else. But can you talk about it in your community and talk about it to your friends and talk about it to others who will say things that you know should not be said? And that we're, what we're talking about in learning that teaches us that that's a racist statement or an uneducated statement. 
until we can talk to our friends and others about that, nothing's going to change. But I deeply appreciate all of the folk who are on here tonight, especially my wife, who came up with a question. So I, I appreciate all of you who are here tonight. And uh, well, I, I do really, have another question. I really, I really appreciate the white <laughs> for taking this stand as a law firm. And because this is what's going to need to happen. People in that position, and it's going to cost him. And I'm praying that other folk will make up for whatever it costs so that he can continue doing the right thing. Because economics has always been the key that people have used to turn off any kind of reform and anybody who wants to do anything to do the right thing. So thank you all for being with us tonight. Thank you, everyone, and look forward to seeing you again. Remember the small group session, sign up for that. And then after that, we're going to look at um, the Tulsa massacre and, and Black Wall Street. So that's going to be our topic for uh, November. Mrs. Bailey still had a question. Yes. Yes, it was for Chief Bay. Um, since you uh, brought up on the uh, on the podcast and you brought up George Floyd's um, picture and that you know everybody knows what happened to him, uh, I know in nursing um, there is a rule that if you see um, patient abuse, you have so many minutes to report it, and if you are if you don't report it in time, you are held accountable. Now, what, what happened with George Floyd? Um, does, does that seem does that hold the same with officers also? If you're seeing an abuse of a, a citizen by another officer, because these uh, the other police officers were standing around. So how are they held accountable to that? That if you see an abuse of a citizen that was over overrated or overdone, you know, do they have the, the responsibility of reporting that? And how many minutes, you know, is it, um, how does that operate in the police force? Well, it's been my experience. I mean, I, I grew up in the state police, uh, spent over 25 years there, retired at the rank of captain. Um, uh, like I said, a few years in uh, Middletown as a chief and now chief of police here in Lancaster. It's been my experience that that has always been a rule because we have a code of conduct and we have core values and we have uh, policies that uh, that that uh, dictate uh, proper conduct when an officer sees another officer uh, uh, basically committing a crime. But what it comes down to, and you said the word, Mrs. Bailey, is accountability. And a lot of times in the past, people in command positions weren't holding their people accountable. And that's what it comes down to. Um, and then, you know, if it, it comes out that another officer witnessed an offense and didn't report it, now both of them will be held accountable. I can assure you that that's how it is in Lancaster under my command. I can assure you of that. Um, yes. Right, but thank you. I can't speak to how other Maybe chiefs so. If, you know, conduct their business, but I can tell you it comes down to accountability or lack thereof. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Thanks again, Chief, for participating tonight. We really okay. appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Right. Thank you.